What if I told you that the DNA inside you isn't really your own, at least not all of it? Around 8% of all our genetic information is from viruses infecting us and leaving their genome inside ours. And the really weird thing is that you probably wouldn't be alive without one of these ancient viruses inside you. In fact, humanity likely wouldn't exist at all without an infection tens of millions of years ago. Much of the ancient viruses in us have turned to DNA fossils, viral genomes that have accumulated so many mutations that they are not functional. Instead of being buried in the earth like traditional fossils, these viral fossils are buried in our DNA. But parts of these viruses are still very functional and in use. Our cells have taken some of the genes from the viruses infecting us and turned them into our own tools. Here is the story of how virus infections very likely led to the evolution of the mammalian placenta and gave rise to all placental mammals from cows, cats and elephants to primates and us humans. Viruses are tiny, infectious things. They have genes but no cellular structure, and they infect cells to make more copies of themselves. A virus turns a cell into a virus factory. When the viruses are ready, they then break out of the cell, and this new swarm of viruses moves on to infect other cells, jumping from one person to the next. In humans, viruses cause illnesses ranging from the common cold to AIDS. The human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, causing AIDS, is part of a class of retroviruses. Retroviruses differ from most other viruses in that upon entry into the cell, they can turn their RNA genome into double-stranded DNA, which is how we store our genetic information. Then the retrovirus can integrate its freshly made DNA genome into our genome, becoming part of us. Although a retrovirus can make a home in our genome, it doesn't get passed on to our children. This is because they don't usually infect the germline cells, the eggs and the sperm. But sometimes retroviruses have ended up infecting our germline cells and have been permanently made part of our genome. These integrated viruses pass on from generation to generation. This is why our genome has the remains of ancient viral infections that make up that 8% of our DNA. And now we get to the really interesting part. With viral genes available in us, our cells have made use of one viral gene in a really revolutionary way. The envelope glycoprotein coded by the ENV gene gives the retroviruses a way to fuse their outer membrane with the membrane of the cell they are infecting. The envelope glycoprotein, or ENV protein, recognizes a cellular membrane protein, anchors itself to the protein and slips inside the cell. With the viral ENV gene adopted, cells gain the ability to fuse together. They can fuse together to make a sheet of cells that have multiple nucleuses and share all cell organelles. Though this only happens if the cells also have the membrane protein recognized by ENV on the cell surface. Both are needed for fusion. This sheet of cells opens up completely new possibilities for embryonic development, allowing for the formation of the placenta. More and more evidence supports that adopting the ENV gene turned our ancestors from egg-laying mammals to placental mammals, drastically changing the way the embryo develops. With the evolution of the placenta, an embryo does not need to be in an egg, facing the outside world, but stays safe inside the mother. The placenta is an organ connecting the developing fetus and the mother inside the womb. The fetus's blood flows through the umbilical cord to the placenta, where only a thin lining of tissue separates the fetus's blood from the mother's blood. Outermost on this very thin tissue layer is the syncytiothropal blast, 
a layer of cells fused together via syncytin-2 protein. Syncytin-2 is the name we have given to the domesticated end of gene in our genome. The fused together syncytiothropoblast cell sheet is invasive and is what implants the embryo to the wall of the mother's womb. Later, the syncytiothropoblast facilitates the flow of nutrients and oxygen between the mother and the fetus. And its functions don't stop there. It also produces hormones, regulates the immune response, and protects the fetus from pathogens. We probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a rare event around 40 million years ago. A retrovirus infected our ancient ancestor, and its genome happened to end up in the germline cells and spread through the population. It inserted itself in chromosome 6, giving us syncytin 2. This here is what parts of the human syncytin 2 protein looks like, using X-ray crystallography to determine its 3D shape. This here is not the full syncytin 2 protein, its full structure has not been determined. This part here is key in the fusion of membranes. Syncytin 2 is not the only viral NF gene that we have turned to our use. In a separate rare event around 25 million years ago, another retroviral infection gave us syncytin 1, another viral NF gene that became part of us. While we have a model for how syncytin 2 fuses cells together to form and resupply the syncytiothropoblast with new cells, the role of syncytin 1 is not as clear. But the two likely work together to fuse cells into the syncytiothropoblast. More and more evidence supports the key role of virally derived syncytins in placental formation. The cells forming the syncytiothropoblast can't fuse when syncytins are blocked, and removing mouse syncytins completely disrupts the formation of their placenta. We humans have two virally derived syncytins. Syncytin 1 and Syncytin 2. Placental mammals are many, but very interestingly, most placental mammals don't share our syncytins. Instead, the incorporation of retroviral end gene for mammalian placental formation has happened over and over, at least 10 times are known so far. So far, a syncytin gene has been found in every mammal studied, with different syncytins fusing placental cells in different mammalian groups. A model proposed by Thierry Heidmann and colleagues from the Gustave Rossi Institute explains the findings like this. The first syncytin gene domesticated came from a retrovirus infection around 150 million years ago. This syncytin gave rise to all placental mammals. The first syncytin has since been replaced by newer syncytins, unique to each mammalian group. Each new syncytin has given the species an evolutionary advantage. With enough time, millions of years, more rare germline infections leading to virus gene domestication have taken place, giving mammals a variety of syncytin genes. This model is supported by findings like the NV syncytin, a domesticated N gene that seems to be crucial for placental formation in old world monkeys like macaques. The gene is found in the human placenta as well, but has lost its ability to fuse cells together. The human NV could be a syncytin gene that has been replaced in humans by syncytin 1 and syncytin 2, but is still functioning in old world monkeys. Not only have retrovirus infections likely initiated and shaped the evolution of the placenta of mammals, they have done so in non-mammals as well. Recently, the Mabuya lizard, a lizard that has a placenta and gives live birth, was found to have a syncytin gene of its own. As with the syncytin genes of mammals, this syncytin was able to fuse cells grown in a cell culture and was expressed in the placenta. With the placenta evolving multiple times independently, it seems like a successful strategy for embryonic development. The retroviruses in our genome are not merely along for the ride. They have drastically shaped evolution and likely brought about our existence. 
we are not only descendants of earlier primates, we are descendants of retroviruses. Thank you for watching. Check out the other videos on this channel and leave a comment down below. I'll try to answer all your comments. If you haven't subscribed, do so for more content on the strange world of microbiology and cutting-edge biotechnology. See you again.